it's on. Okay, I'm, uh, my subject is uh, uh, something called happiness research. That's uh, a new type, relatively new kind of research in, the, in economics over the past 30 years or so. And uh, pro probably the biggest name uh, in this is Bruno Fry from the uh, University of Zurich. And he may well win the Nobel Prize someday in economics because of this. That's usually what it takes, some new and different twist on uh, some aspect of the field of economics. And, uh, but what it also is, is uh, an, an insidious attempt to pretty much uh, uh, ignore the progress economic science has made over the past 50 or 75 years in order to, uh, to promote socialism. And so, uh, uh, and I'll, let me explain to you briefly what this so-called happiness research is and, and why people like Bruno Fry think it's so important is that uh, they say basically, rather than measuring economic performance in terms of such things as GDP and how much is produced, how much affluence is uh, created, uh, what's really important is happiness. Uh, it's not how much stuff we create, it's just happiness per se. And uh, there are some British socialists who have written uh, uh, several books about this. One of them is called The Spirit Level, and the other one is called Affluenza, uh, claiming that affluence is a disease like influenza. Uh, and, and so it's really uh, is an attack on the whole idea that affluence is a good thing. And so uh, as Hans mentioned this morning to me that, well, if Bruno Fry ever does win the Nobel Prize, he surely would give the money back because it would make him very unhappy to accept that a quarter of a million dollars or whatever they pay for the, for the Nobel Prize. And, uh, and the, the really, uh, the, the really uh, uh, horrible thing from a, the perspective of, of an economist of this is that uh, this research is based on opinion polls. And for, for a long, long time, uh, it was understood by all economists, not just the Austrian school, that what matters in studying human behavior is what, uh, what we call demonstrated preference, people's actual choices uh, in the marketplace, not their opinions, because there are, you know, people will say anything. I can think of a, an opinion poll on uh, environmental issues that I recently ran across where uh, people were asked, are you in favor of recycling? And something like 95% said yes. And then the question was changed to, uh, are you in favor of recycling if it will cost you $50 a month? And it was something like 10% said yes on that. So these can be, certainly can be manipulated. And, but to give you an idea of why this is sort of a, a shocking uh, abandonment of common sense in economics, is that there's a, a famous article, at least among the uh, Austrian school economists, by Murray Rothbard called Toward a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics. And, uh, and so for those of you, not everyone, you know, we don't have that many economists here in the, in the room, I guess. But here's, here's what he says about demonstrated preference. And this is not unique to the Austrians. This is something that um, most economists uh, subscribe to for a long, long time. Uh, the, con the concept of demonstrated preference is simply this, that actual choice reveals or demonstrates a man's preferences. That is, his preferences are deduct deductible from what he, he, or deducible rather, from what he has chosen in action. Thus, if a man chooses to spend an hour at a concert rather than a movie, we deduce that the former was preferred or ranked higher on his value scale. Similarly, if a man spends $5 on a shirt, we deduce that he preferred purchasing the shirt to any other uses he could have had found for the money. This concept of preference rooted in real choices forms the keystone of the logical structure of economic analysis, and particularly of utility and welfare analysis. And on the subject of uh, opinion polls, here's what Rothbard said. Uh, One of the most absurd procedures based on uh, a constancy assumption, that is the assumption that people's preferences never change, which of course they do. Uh, uh, yeah, women are legendary, aren't they, for, for uh, uh, being, uh, changing their minds. Uh, Deanna may yet change her mind, who knows? Uh, we have a few more days. Uh, here's what Rothbard said. One of the most absurd procedures based on a constant assumption has been the attempt to arrive at consumers' preference scales not through observed real action, but through quizzing him by questionnaires. In vacuo, a few consumers are questioned at length on which abstract 
bundle of commodities they would prefer to another abstract bundle and so on. Not only does this suffer from the constancy error, but no assurance can be attached to the mere questioning of people when they are not confronted with the choices in actual practice. Not only will a person's valuation differ when talking about them from when he is actually choosing, but there is also no guarantee that he is telling the truth. And so uh, the people who uh, are doing this so-called happiness research just ignore this. The whole economics profession, for the most part, uh, accepted this for generations. And, uh, and all of a sudden, there are these economists who said, well, uh, what people say uh, in a questionnaire uh, is, is, is acceptable. Uh, they give no reason for this. Uh, I, can, I, couldn't, I, I searched a lot of the literature. I couldn't find any explanation given for why all of a sudden uh, they think this is legitimate to do this. They just do it because it has provided a gold mine for economists looking for uh, ways to pad their resumes because uh, no longer do they have to uh, uh, go and do the hard work of finding data with which they can use to test their hypotheses or their theories. They just make it up. They just send out questionnaires. And that's their data. So they fabricate their own data now uh, 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 related to, to, to so-called happiness. And another thing that they, they do uh, with this is they assume that uh, utility uh, in, in the language of economics is cardinal after all. It is, uh, if you ever take a principles of economics course, the word utility is basically used as a synonym for satisfaction, human satisfaction. And it's been understood for a long time that uh, utility is subjective. It's in the eye of the decision maker. Uh, there's no way of putting an objective value on uh, how many utils uh, that of, of satisfaction you get from consuming a cappuccino or a glass of red wine or something like that. It's subjective. The happiness researchers say, nah, forget that. It's, it's objective after all, because we will send up uh, questionnaires and ask people how they rank that cup of cappuccino on a scale of one to six, and we will get a number. We'll get a three or a four or five, and, and that'll be our measurement of utils, how many utils they get uh, based on their opinions, not based on their actual choices. And so once you've done that, you can make interpersonal utility comparisons. You can say such things as, uh, well, an extra thousand dollars that goes to a millionaire doesn't create much additional satisfaction because he's already a millionaire. But an extra thousand dollars that goes to a poor man uh, probably creates uh, a great many noodles because it goes to a poor man who doesn't have much money. Uh, therefore, we can increase total societal satisfaction by taking the money, the thousand dollars away from the rich man and giving it to the poor man. Uh, on net, society will be uh, improved. And this, in the language of economics, is called a social welfare function. It's one of the things that was debunked by the marginal, uh, the uh, beginning with the marginal revolution in the 19th century and on into the 20th century with the uh, improved analysis of uh, what is called welfare economics. And so uh, the, the so-called happiness researchers have uh, pretty much abandoned uh, really the, the heart of uh, the, the study of uh, decision making in economics in order to uh, base their, their, their uh, work on questionnaires, which are very questionable uh, indeed. And so uh, I have here a, a summary article of this by Bruno Fry and Aloise Stutzer in the Journal of Economic Literature. This is published by the American Economic Association, and so it's a very prominent publication, and it's called What Can Economists Learn from Happiness Research? In this Journal of Economic Literature, all the articles are big, long surveys of the state of the art in a particular subdiscipline or area of research. And so uh, if you want to know what this is about, this is the article to start with right here. It's in the June 02 issue of the Journal of Economic Literature. And so to describe what, what is going on here in this uh, happiness research, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what it says, uh, what Bruno Fry and his co-author say uh, here. Um, one of the things that, as I said, they simply assume that utility is cardinal after all by virtue of having conducted opinion surveys, which is a very, very dubious uh, thing. And, uh, and uh, Bruno Fry, in writing this article, is, is, he's just celebrating this. It's, uh, he's very cheerful about the whole thing. Uh, and so maybe he does think he's going to get the Nobel Prize for this. And here's one of the things he says is, happiness functions, uh, as in a, a mathematical function, have sometimes been looked at as the best existing approximation 
to a social welfare function. It seems that at long last, the so far empirically empty social welfare maximization is given a new lease on life. So like I said, they're sending out these opinion surveys and they're claiming that they can use the surveys to uh, instruct the government on how to maximize societal welfare. And in my, I did a little web search of this and uh, preparing this lecture, and one article I found uh, said that the government of Brazil is, uh, is uh, amending its constitution. I don't know if it's done it yet already to, to mandate that the government must maximize uh, status, happiness, maximize happiness of the people. And so uh, uh, we already have that in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, it, it has been so perverted and, and, uh, and misinterpreted over the years that the government thinks uh, uh, the Constitution gives it a rubber stamp to do just about anything. But this would be, I assume, the Brazilian version of that. Uh, if the government gives itself a mandate to create happiness, well, who's to define what happiness is? Well, of course, the government uh, will define what happiness is. And so uh, this will be a, a rubber stamp to do anything there. Uh, also, uh, another big claim in this literature is that it claims that income has increased dramatically since World War II, but happiness has not. So the wealthier, the, uh, on average, people of the world have gotten, the, the more unhappy they become. And this uh, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. It says, if you work hard, you save your money, uh, and, and, and you succeed, you're an entrepreneur, you create new products, you, you have employees who work for you, you're thriving, it makes you unhappy, therefore you do more of it. You go to work every day, you keep, you keep it up. And so uh, but that, that's the logic of what, of what they're saying here. And this is a, a, this is a claim that's made in, in the paper. Uh, interpersonal utility comparisons are resurrected, like they say. Uh, here's another quote from the article. Wealthier people impose a negative external effect on poorer people, but not vice versa. That is, uh, hardworking, industrious, entrepreneurial people who are successful financially impose a negative externality, and a negative cost on poorer people because the poorer people are envious of their success. But, uh, but on the other hand, the welfare parasites of the world do not impose any kind of cost on the people who pay for their welfare. There's no cost at all of that. That's what, that's what, this, that's what this says. It's you know, uh, black is white, night is dark, night is uh, uh, you know, morning, uh, you know, up is down. Uh, that, that, that's what modern economics uh, is doing. Uh, another uh, conclusion of this research is that raising everybody's income does not increase everyone's happiness. However, improving one's income in comparison to others does. So reducing material inequality increases overall happiness somehow. Uh, socialism, in other words, as, you know, as Friedrich Hayek says in, in a, one of the later editions of The Road to Serfdom, uh, socialism began uh, as uh, nationalization of the means of production. But by the time you get to the 1930s and 40s, it had essentially become to mean uh, the redistribution of income through the institutions of the welfare state and the progressive income tax. And so, but the, but the objective was always the same. It was always egalitarianism. It was always uh, redistribution, whether the, the vehicle was nationalization or welfare statism. And so that's, that's what this happiness, so-called happiness research is saying, is that uh, socialism is what makes us happy. And you know, the, the logical conclusion of all this is that the people who lived in the Soviet Union must have been the happiest people in the world because that was the whole ideological basis, wasn't it? The area of, the, of, the, of socialism in the Soviet Union. Um, another, another conclusion from this article is that the production of luxury goods such as expensive watches or yachts is a waste of productive resources because overall happiness is reduced since such objects create so much envy. And so, so Therefore, we should, we should not allow this to happen. Uh, you know, and I have to think of what Ludwig von Mises said about this. As he pointed out the historical fact that uh, almost all of the things that uh, people enjoy in their normal lives, refrigeration, automobiles, all started out as luxury goods for the wealthiest people. But the entrepreneurs always figured out that you can't become really, really rich 
unless you figure out how to sell the thing cheap enough so that the masses can buy it. That's how to make the big money. That, that's how Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller and, and Bill Gates made the big, big money, is selling it to the masses as cheaply as, as possible. Uh, and, so, and, and so this kind of a statement by an economist totally, totally ignores that. Uh, uh, they also resurrect Keynesianism in addition to socialism with this. Uh, here's another statement from the Bruno Fry article. If unemployment rises by five percentage points, the inflation rate must decrease by 8.5 percentage points to keep the population equally happy. And so they look at a happiness trade-offs between inflation and unemployment as a way of sort of a backdoor sneaking in the long discredited Phillips curve uh, into economics. Uh, another conclusion from this article in the Journal of Economic Literature, welfare payments should be increased to compensate for larger families so as to maintain the subjective well-being of the families. There's no discussion at all in this article of the, the economic side effects of the welfare state. There's no discussion of destruction of the work uh, uh, ethic, destruction of the family, all the gigantic literature on the ill effects of welfare statism are just totally ignored. They, they, they just say uh, greater material equality is a good thing, period. And, and, just, and, uh, and how unscholarly is that? How, you know, how, how scholarly is it to ignore 50 years of research in your field uh, of economics on the effects of the welfare state? Uh, another statement, uh, page 427, is Quote, the fight for relative positions is socially wasteful, and the high income recipients, as winners of these races, should be more heavily taxed. So they, they call working, saving your money, investing, taking risks, being an entrepreneur, producing new products, uh, running a race. So just running a race. And so they, they, they totally ignore the fact that the results of all this kind of behavior is not just the production of wealth for you, but the creation of wealth for a lot of others, job creation, and so forth. That's not even mentioned here. It's just all about envy and, and the inequality, uh, the fight for relative positions. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, Bruno Fry in this article mentions that John, the, uh, the socialist John Kenneth Galbraith is held up as the father of happiness research uh, thanks to his book, The Affluent Society, in which he argued that money does not buy happiness. But uh, I don't think Galbraith ever gave a penny of his money to charity that he made from publishing The Affluent Society. So he was not known as a, as a philanthropist at all. And so uh, if you want to know where this is coming from, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith is sort of the godfather of, of this. And uh, what, one other thing I'd like to mention here, uh, the, uh, the next thing, is you know a lot of economic research. If you if you look in the econ the big the top economics journals, and you look at it, there's usually a blur of mathematics, uh, a blur of econometrics and statistics. And then if you read the the summary at the very end or the abstract at the beginning of the article, uh, you'll often find articles that say the most mundane, pedestrian, and downright stupid sounding things. Water runs downhill. So they'll, they'll use all this very impressive scientific looking math and statistics to prove that water runs downhill. And, and, and mostly it's because they, they choose a topic that they know it has to be true. You know, no person on earth would ever uh, argue with some uh, very simple minded proposition and then use all this pyrotechnics to prove that, that it's true and they get another line on the resume. And this happiness research is among the worst in this. And, and so I'm going to read you some direct quotes from this research. Uh, the, and keep in mind, all, all of these quotes I'm going to read follow pages and pages of mathematics, mathematical model building and econometric testing uh, to come at these conclusions. And so these are all quotes. Uh, the first one is, persons with higher income have more opportunities to achieve what they desire. <laughs> Who would ever have guessed? British lottery winners reported higher mental well-being the following year. Who would ever guess that? There is more to subjective well-being than just income level. Well, that's the Austrians have been saying that forever, of course. Another quote, on average, 
persons living in rich countries are happier than those living in poor countries. <laughs> Page 416 of the Bruno Frau. Happiness of unemployed persons is much lower than that of employed persons. This is what the economics profession has become. Experiencing unemployment makes people very unhappy. <laughs> Freedom and happiness are positively related. Okay, well then they have, they're advocating socialism, which is slavery. Okay, and they don't realize that they're, they're contradicting themselves when they say freedom is good for happiness, and then they advocate the slavery of socialism. Uh, inflation lowers reported individual well-being. So, so if the next new car you buy costs three times more than, the, than it did a year ago, you'll be unhappy. Uh, aren't you glad? You, but then you have to read a, a economics journal article to know that. Allowing people to vote makes them happy. That's probably true, it's a bad thing, but it's probably true a lot of people. Uh, happy people smile more during social interactions. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. This is in the prestigious Journal of Economic Literature. Persons with higher income have more opportunities to achieve what they desire. In particular, they can buy more material goods and services. <laughs> It sounds like a two-year-old wrote this article. <laughs> People receiving an inheritance reported a higher mental well-being in the following year. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's enough of that. And so, uh, so that's, that's the sort of mundane idiocy that you see in the happiness research. Then you see it everywhere else in, the, in other, all, every other field of economics in the so-called mainstream journals. And now, uh, there's the one very bad book that was published in, in Great Britain by, it's called uh, The Spirit Level. Uh, the subtitle is Why Equality is Better for Everyone uh, by uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. And this, this book is a, a, a textbook example. If I taught a course in econometrics or, or statistics to undergraduates, I would use this book as an example of how not to do uh, to work with statistics, and the whole book is filled with scatter diagrams, purporting to find correlations between uh, inequality and something, some other thing, some other thing, and th and they don't investigate any other cause of the other things than uh, inequality, and so they don't even do multiple regressions. It, it's just a, you know a page after page after page of correlation coefficients. And the conclusions, which the British government loves, by the way, I've read the rave reviews by members of parliament, and they just, they just love this, uh, ju just like they, they must have loved the general theory by Keynes, because it, it provides sort of a, a phony baloney intellectual cover for what politicians want to do anyway, and just spend money like drunken sailors uh, with no responsibility uh, on their part. But here's what, uh, among, among the things, greater equal material equality, not equality of opportunity or anything like that, but material equality, supposedly leads to the following. Better community life, better mental health, less drug use, better physical health, less obesity, smarter people, more recycling, thank God for that, more recycling, <laughs> fewer teenage births, less violence, less imprisonment, greater social mobility, fewer dysfunctional people. Imagine that, the bigger the welfare state, the fewer the dysfunctional people there are. That, that surely is exactly the opposite of the truth. When you, you, know, when you pay people to pretty much exit society and live on welfare, and they don't have to get up and get dressed and go to work every day, that's how they become dysfunctional. Uh, less anxiety, there's much less anxiety, and greater self-esteem, supposedly. And uh, there's, there's also a very good book called The Spirit Level Delusion. It's written by Christopher Snowden. So he's also a British uh, intellectual. And, uh, and he, he takes this on uh, and, and just shreds uh, the, this, the spirit level book. He, he, just, he just totally blows it apart. Uh, because the people who wrote this book are uh, epidemiologists. They're not economists. Uh, uh, and, so, and that's what they do. They find these correlations. And, uh, and, uh, but of course, correlation is not causation. And one of the things uh, Christopher Snowden does in his book is uh, uh, to, to mock 
the uh, the sort of the low level of uh, of a, of a uh, statistical analysis in this other book, which has become apparently quite the hit in England, by uh, he has a, a his own some of his own uh, scatter diagrams, where and one of them is my favorite, where he purports a positive correlation, a positive correlation between the rate of recycling and the suicide rate. So, I mean, and he says, well, if you look at this, the more uh, you know, the higher the, the rate of recycling, uh, the more likely uh, it is that you have more suicides in, in your community. Just uh, <clears throat> because he used that to, to make the point that uh, you know, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess, and you can, and you can do these things. And uh, and, uh, and one example of the shoddiness of this uh, this research <clears throat> is teenage births. They claim that uh, greater inequality creates higher teenage births. And they actually use data from some American states, and they compare uh, Utah, uh, they used to say Utah, and I'll read you one short sentence from the, the critique by Christopher Snowden. He says, Wilkinson and Pickett seem unable to look beyond inequality for any explanation. And so, for example, when they say that teen births are twice as high in the state of Mississippi in the US than in Utah, they put it down to inequality and only inequality. Uh, then they say, a far more likely explanation is that 60% of Utah's population belong to the strict Mormon religion. Uh, so you know, there are many reasons why teenage births would, would fluctuate state by state. And it's not just inequality, but their, their whole book is like, is like this. They don't even attempt multiple regression in that book. Uh, but the economists do. The economists do, but it, it, their research is just as bad uh, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And so, uh, so the, you know, I think you have a good idea by now of what uh, happiness research is about. And uh, I'm going to conclude with one uh, concluding statement from Christopher Snowden's book that I think really explains what this is all about. Uh, and here's what he says in his uh, concluding chapter. Apologists for Marxism have made myriad excuses for their ideolog ideology's failure to provide the same standard of living and liberty as was enjoyed in capitalist nations. Until recently, few have been so brazen as to claim that lowering living standards and curtailing freedom were the intended consequences, let alone that people would be happier with less of either. In that sense, books like The Spirit Level represent a departure for the left. Limiting choice, reducing wealth, and lowering aspirations are now openly advocated as desirable ends in themselves, because that's what makes everybody happy, supposedly. And so uh, the, the socialists have given up on saying, uh, well, yes, uh, socialism can produce more material wealth. Yeah, they, they lost that argument a long time ago. And so they've resorted now to saying, uh, wealth schmelf. It's, uh, it's uh, inequality that counts. That's what makes us happy, even if we have to make us all poorer, you know, every, everybody all the way around. And so, uh, and that's, that's, that's the, uh, uh, really what's going on. I don't think Bruno Fry is a socialist. He's known as being a pretty conservative, free market oriented guy. I've been reading his uh, research for 30 years. I, I, th I th think very highly of uh, a lot of his research in the field of public choice, uh, for example. But I think the motivation by these economists is that uh, you have to understand that uh, in a lot of schools in the US, which are very similar to Europe, uh, graduate training in, in economics is several years of training in math and statistics. And then you write a doctoral dissertation, which is basically uh, you'll get some, some hot new econometric technique that your dissertation advisor is known for, and he will tell you or she will tell you, go find a topic that you can use this technique with. And so, and the topic, you know, and happiness is a very broad area. And so, and so for economists, it provides unlimited opportunities for doctoral dissertations and research papers and publications and resume building. And that's why I think Bruno Fry is so giddy about this. And I've, I've seen him personally give a presentation about this. And he does that kind of giddy and, and happy about, about all this, sort of celebrating uh, this, uh, uh, because he has uh, done a lot of publishing in this area. So I don't think uh, people like that are just you know, hardcore uh, socialist ideologues but they're falling into the trap. That's why another presentation I made on this, the title I gave was The Trojan Horse of Happiness Research. And so a lot of the economists like Bruno Fry, I think, 
are just uh, stepping into the trap that the socialists have laid for them by adopting their research on, on happiness, because it will be used to make uh, the case of more income redistribution, more socialism, more control, and, and, and so forth. And it will all have the prestige of the economics profession, especially if a Nobel Prize is awarded for this. It will be a huge boost uh, for the cause of socialism, just like the Nobel Prize to Paul Krugman was a boost for Keynesianism. And, uh, and I guess if they can give the Nobel Prize to Krugman, they can give it to anybody. Uh, I would much prefer Bruno Fry to Krugman as far as that goes anyway. And my time is up, thank you.